Hello everyone, welcome to our channel. Today, we're diving into a single process that can hold two completely opposite futures in its hands. Uranium enrichment. It's the science that can light up our cities with clean energy or threaten them with nuclear weapons. So here's how we're going to break it down. First, we'll get into what makes uranium so unique. Then we'll look at the incredible difficult science of actually separating it. We'll explore the main tech here today, see who the major players are in the global game, and finally, take a look at what the future holds for this really powerful fuel. Okay, let's start with the uranium itself. Because it turns out, not all uranium is created equal. And that small difference, well, that's the key to everything we're about to talk about. Brace yourselves. What do solid spinners and nuclear weapons have in common? I know, it sounds like a bad will, right? But the answer connects directly to our topic here. Uranium enrichment. It's the process at the very heart of both clean energy and global conflict. Before we can even think about enriching anything though, we have to know what we're working with. You see, the uranium we pull out of the ground isn't just one thing, it's a mixture of two main types, or isotopes. Chemically, they're identical, but they have slightly different weights. And the first thing that jumps out at you is just how lopsided it is. Almost all natural uranium, we're talking about over 99%, is an isotope called uranium-238. But here's the catch, uranium-238 is stable. It can't sustain the kind of chain reactions you need for a power plant or for your weapon. That tiny little sliver though, that 0.72%, that is everything. Uranium-235 is what scientists call fissile. And that's just a fancy way of saying is the key ingredient. Is the part that can be split to either power a whole city or cause its destruction. So here's the crucial point. If you want to use uranium for pretty much anything powerful, we need a lot more of that uranium-235. But how on earth do you separate two types of atoms that are, for all practical purposes, identical twins? And when I say it's a challenge, I mean it's a massive challenge. A U-235 atom is only 1.26% lighter than a U-238 atom. Trying to separate them based on that tiny, tiny weight difference is one of the hardest industrial processes humans have ever come up with. So to have any chance of exploiting that minuscule difference in mass, you first have to get the atoms moving freely. You do that by taking the solid uranium and turning it into a gas called uranium hexafluoride, or UF6. The stuff is the starting point for almost all modern enrichment. Alright, now we get to the cool part, the technology. The way we saw these atoms has changed dramatically over the years, moving from these huge brute force methods to something way more elegant and efficient. And you can really see the massive leap in technology here. The original method, gaseous diffusion, was a beast. It needed enormous buildings and just used a mind-boggling amount of electricity. But the modern standard, the gas centrifuge, is an absolute game-changer. It uses a tiny fraction of the energy and space, which makes the whole process so much more attainable. So how does it actually work? Well, let's go back to that salad spinner. Now imagine one spinning at over 70,000 rotations per minute. Insane speeds. Inside, the heavier U-238 gas gets flung out of the walls, while the slightly lighter U-235 kinda hangs out near the center. That gas, now just a little bit richer in U-235, is then piped to the next centrifuge, and then to the next, and then to the next in a huge chain called a cascade. And with each step, the uranium-235 concentration inches up. And the technology, you know, it just keeps evolving. On the horizon, we have laser enrichment like Psy Lakes. It's potentially an order of magnitude more efficient, but this is a double-edged sword, because it also raises huge alarms. The facilities could be so small and energy efficient that they could be hidden from satellites, which is why the American Physical Society calls it a game-changer for proliferation risk. So why does all this technology matter so much on the world stage? Well, because different levels of enrichment lead to completely different outcomes, from generating electricity to, well, creating weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so this is where the rubber really meets the road. To understand the stakes, you just have to look at these numbers. Most power plants run on what's called low enriched uranium, or LEU, which is just 3 to 5% uranium 235. But the really critical line in the sand is 20%. Anything above that is considered highly enriched uranium, or HEU. And that's material that can be used to make a weapon. And if you want to build the core of a bomb, you need to push that enrichment all the way past 90%. And this, right here, is why the international community gets so nervous when a country like Iran starts enriching up to 60%. When you accumulate and continue to accumulate 
uh, and you are the only country in the world that it's, is doing something like this at a level which is very, very close to the level that you need to have a nuclear explosive device, then we cannot ignore it. Uh, it is not per se a forbidden activity, but we cannot ignore. Because of the physics of it all, getting from natural uranium all the way to 60% is a long, hard slog. But for the final sprint, from 60 to 90, that's a much, much smaller and quicker technical step. You're already most of the way there. That being said, nothing can explain why the international community ironically doesn't get nervous about Israel's nuclear program. It's like that elephant in the room no one wants to talk about. But we can definitely explain the motivation and urge you have right now to go down and click that subscribe button. I have no idea how people can resist that urge. Now, when you look at who's in charge of this market, one name stands out. Russia. Its state-owned company, Rosatom, controls a staggering 40% of the entire world's enrichment capacity. That gives it an incredible amount of influence over the global nuclear fuel supply chain. But here's the interesting thing. Enrichment isn't a one-way street. You can actually reverse the process through something called downblending. In fact, one of the most successful non-proliferation programs in history, Megatons to Megawatts, did exactly that. It took 500 tons of weapons-grade uranium from dismantled Soviet warheads and diluted it down to make peaceful reactor fuel for American power plants. Alright, so where is all of this headed? As the world keeps searching for low-carbon energy, new kinds of nuclear reactors are being designed. And you guessed it, they're creating new demands for a whole new set of challenges for the enrichment industry. A lot of these next-generation reactors require a special kind of fuel, called HALO. That's high SA low-enriched uranium. It's enriched between 5 and 20%. This creates a huge supply chain problem because as of right now, there are no commercial suppliers in Europe or America that can make this stuff at scale. The only major source is Russia, which creates a pretty significant dependency for any Western country trying to build these new reactors. And this quote from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, it just gets right to the heart of the dilemma. As we push for advanced, cleaner nuclear energy, we're also making the technology to enrich uranium more widespread, which is the exact same technology that can be used to build weapons. Which leaves us with this massive, critical question for our energy future. This technology offers us the potential for incredible power, but also incredible peril. Figuring out how to manage that dual-use nature, that's gonna be one of the greatest challenges of our time. Thanks for watching today's video. See you all next time. And the force? It would take Yankee Stadium full of dynamite to equal the energy released in the complete fission of an amount of U-235 the size of a baseball.